All right, welcome into the Render Podcast. We're so excited to be talking all about design decks today. And today I've got Kaylee and Kathleen with me. Hi. They are experts at design decks as well as our entire team. So we're excited to tell you all about that. Kaylee's been on the podcast plenty of times before, so you already know her. Kathleen is new to the podcast, but she's not new to our team. She's been here for almost a year now, which is exciting. And they both are just so great at the design deck world and treating our clients really great. So let's get into it. Let's go. Let's do it. Kaylee, do you want to talk more about the reason and the kind of definition between renderings and all of that for yeah. design decks? Yeah, absolutely. So you might be wondering what we mean by design deck or rendering. I think we've talked about on the podcast before um, in one of our sales conversations about mm-hmm. renderings and stuff. So if you want to go back to how we implement these and really get a better understanding of that, listen to one of those episodes. Um, but basically what a rendering is, is just a visual representation of your proposed design um, or the actual design that you're planning on executing for your client. And so um, what's funny is rendering is kind of one of the ways that we got to our name render when we were going through our renaming process. So that's like another the core word of yes. rendering is our business name. Yes, that's another story for another day. But um, that's kind of that's kind of what a rendering is. There are companies in the um, industry that go full out on renderings and do it to scale. Um, They'll CAD out, um, which by CAD, CAD, I mean, is a uh, program. Um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head what the actual definition of CAD or the abbreviation of CAD is. I can't remember. It's like a 3D type of looking um, design area. So it's like a layout, but it makes it where it's 3D looking. Ish. Yeah. Something like that. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Um, So, you know, interior designers use it. um, Architects use it. We don't get that fancy over here at Render. Uh, We are proficient in our rendering creations and concepts, um, and it helps our clients visualize kind of what we're executing. So that's a rendering. And then a design deck is essentially pulling all of the design elements into one document for our clients, and we present it to them when we send them a quote. Um, And that typically includes a project description, um, anything that we're like really high level highlighting. We might include um, specific imagery that our clients have sent us paired with imagery that we've found that inspires the overall design. Often you'll find um, a color palette in there. Um, and then we'll include all of the renderings that we've designed for each space. Um, I have included, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see this, but if you're not watching on YouTube and you're listening, um, you can go to our blog for this episode. It'll be linked in the show notes. Which, side note, if you didn't know, we have a blog for every single podcast. Um, TJ on our team writes those um, and so spends a lot of time on them. So if you haven't seen that, for sure check it out, but that'll be linked in the show notes. But this is kind of what a visual rendering is. This is for a backdrop. And then this one is for a lounge. Um, Again, if you're listening, go check out our blog for our YouTube. Uh, But that's kind of what that is. So it's just a collection of all the things that we're pulling together. Um, And the reason why we do that is a couple different reasons. One, we work in a very visual industry. what you are executing if you own a rental business is all visual elements for an event or um, a set design or whatever. And it's really hard for clients to kind of understand the overall concept until they actually see it on site if all you're showing them is just pictures of mm-hmm. the elements. So if you're looking at a typical quote, you're going to have line items of each element, you know, like a sofa and then chairs and a rug if you're doing a lounge. And it can be really hard for clients to kind of conceptualize how that will be laid out. And so a rendering really comes alongside of them and helps them visualize what that's going to be like. It also helps cut down on um, missed expectations. So let's say um, we have a certain way of putting together lounges in our team, you know, like based on the event and how the client wants the lounge to feel. 
we could in our heads think of a, a little different way to set that up. You know, maybe the chairs are facing in on the couch. Maybe they're sideways on the side to allow for more walkway space. Uh, by sending them a rendering of that, they can expect kind of what that's going to look like on site. And if they don't like that, then we can work together as a team and change that um, and make sure that they are fully happy with the design before we even execute it. Um, the second thing that has been really beneficial for us executing renderings and design decks is it helps our internal team. So everyone is on the same page. Um, often for us, our um, design team doesn't go on site unless it is a very large installation. There's a lot of design elements, but unfortunately with the amount of the events that we do, we can't go to every single event. And so by giving our event crew and our installation team and our retrieval team design decks and renderings, they know that they can ex execute the design to what the client has approved to uh, perfection and we don't have to be on site. Yeah, it really, uh, and we bring those in in our team meetings every Monday. And so when we're going through all the operations for the week, we will pull in their quote, we'll pull in the design decks, and then they'll go look at the inventory as well. Um, we even do our design decks in a way that we position the pillows, how we want them to be on site. We position the chairs, we position the rugs. Even if you're layering rugs, we'll position which way we want it layered. Um, and then sometimes we even bring in plants, like you saw in one of the renderings Kaylee showed you, or you can find on our blog. Um, and so we'll design it exactly how we want it to be on site. And so there is little room for questions asked, there's little room for error and um, they have something to reference back to. Yeah, and like she said, a lot of our clients, they can't go out to our warehouse or go to our website and visualize what it will all come together. Us as a team, we can because we do this every day. This is our job. And um, a lot of people don't do this for a living. A lot of people who work with us are not designers, are not interior designers, don't work with furniture specifically or even floral or anything like that. And so us as the professionals, just like if you were to go to a house, a realtor can see through paint and a realtor can see through other design elements that are at a house. Same thing for us. We can see through the blank walls, the blank spaces and events and visualize what our stuff will look like. But our clients can't. And so these renderings and design decks are really helping them understand what it's going to look like. Yeah, and I don't know about you, Kathy, but it has really helped me also conceptualize design for our clients and has given me the ability to kind of push myself on yeah. not doing the same thing over and over and over again, but laying it out on the computer and be like, oh, actually this chair would look better, or like this uh, flower arrangement would look really cool. Let's upsell them there. Yeah, and that's how I really start my quotes out. I, before I start a quote out, I like to do the rendering because then I can see the expectation um, and then that's where I can just get creative with what the client has provided. Yeah, especially when you have lots of different sofas to pick from, lots of different backdrops, lots of different side chairs or tables or anything like that. You can really pull anything you want. You might have a few different pink chairs or a few different uh, leather sofas, and maybe that leather sofa works better with that pink chair, but you can switch them out and see what works best. Yeah. Which then you can go down to your quote on Good Shuffle or wherever you put them and itemize it out from there based on what you're designing. Yeah, our process, I'm very similar. I start with the design deck, I start with pulling inspiration, I then create a rendering, and then I do that simultaneously just to make sure that the product is available because there have been times where I've created a really awesome rendering and then I've gone to create the quote and I'm like, ah, dang, that sofa <laughs> is no longer available. Shoot, I'm gonna have to change this entire design, uh, which then, is fun, you know, because you get to rethink the design. But uh, yeah, it's yeah. helped my process so it helps, much. It helps too because when you said when things aren't available, then you know what to pull from. Like, what can I work with, and then will it work with what I originally created? Yes. You know? Yeah, and same. You might be putting together a quote in Good Shuffle, and you put something together, and then you then go to the design deck, and you're like, ah. I think I'm going to switch that because this is going to look better than you can go back and switch them. So it's really important to have them both up when you're doing that because um, you don't want to get into a situation where you're like, oh, this is really good, but it's not available. And then yeah. you have to switch things up, yeah. which on busy weekends and busy weeks, that can definitely happen. Yes. We ran into that. <laughs> yeah, multiple times. There are many times.
to yeah. it. It's like, ah, okay. Or if you're both working on a different quote but the same day, that can come into effect as well. Yeah. So making sure communication is top of mind in this process. And I think overall, we introduced this practice probably three years ago. Yeah. Was three we really before. started working on refining this process and uh, getting this process set up. And that's kind of when we started implementing it into our client process. And uh, I would say since then, we have seen, one, our increase of bookings uh, because our clients are seeing our expertise. They're coming up to us for our professional opinion. Um, they really like being able to, even if they have a very clear vision in their minds, if you're working with maybe like a planner, a wedding planner, or um, a seasoned designer who does this for their clients and does mood boards, um, even implementing their mood board into our renderings with our specific furniture, I have found has been really helpful for our clients. A lot of times people get nervous because they're like, oh, well, the planner sent me over a mood board. I, I don't want to overstep and I don't want to, um, I don't want to take away from what they've done. And by no means have I ever had a client come back and say, oh, I didn't want this rendering. Like, I, I didn't want right. to do that. Right. I mean, most of the time they're like, oh, awesome. Even if they don't end up using it on site, I mean, it's more for our team on site anyways. Uh, but they always are like, oh, that is so helpful to see the visual. I kind of like had already seen it in my head, but now I know what it looks like with your pieces specifically. Yeah. Right. Um, and so we've seen an increase in bookings for sure. Yeah. Um, we've also seen our clients be extremely satisfied because on site, no longer, there's no longer last minute changes to orders of maybe something shows up on site and they're like, oh, this couch is a different color or this um, couch doesn't pair well with those chairs. Mm -hmm. Could your team go back and get me something else? Um, so we're seeing less of that. Um, still happens, you know, like every, once in, a while. every <laughs> once in a while, very rare, but that does happen sometimes. Um, but then also they, they have a clear expectation of what's coming. They, they're not surprised. And so um, they're a lot more satisfied right. and um, excited about the process. So it can also help if your client is going between two different uh, styles or two different pieces or two different sofas or two different anything, it's helpful for you to do two different renderings and show, hey, this is what it would look like if you use this and this is what it would look like if you use that. Um, so then there is less of, well, I wish I would have gone with that other sofa. I wish I would have been able to do something else. They have a visual and can visualize what that'll be like. Yeah, it helps for concept pitching for sure. Mm -hmm. I know you do this a lot. I do it a lot as well of um, kind of sending a few different concepts of mm -hmm. backdrop options or lounge options. And they're like, oh, I didn't even know that was possible. Cool. Right. Yeah. Love yeah. That. Exactly. Yeah. It also helps your client trust you more, mm -hmm. especially if they are first time to book with you. They haven't done another event with you. Um, it helps them cross this bridge of trust. I teach this in Rental Biz Academy and some of our other courses that your clients are on one side of a bridge and you are on the other. And there's this invisible bridge that um, they might not even know that they have, but they do anyways. And it's a, called a bridge of trust. And there are certain things that you have to do to get over that bridge before they are ready to book with you. And one of those is trusting that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And it's going to look the way that you say it's going to look. And what they see on the website is actually what they're going to have in reality. And if you don't cross that bridge of trust and you don't overcome some of their hesitations to book with you, it's going to take longer for them to book with you. And so having these design decks, having these renderings is going to allow them to trust you more, to see exactly what it's going to be like. And I would say people who have design decks versus don't have design decks are way faster to book with you yeah. and are less likely to ghost you. We all have those clients that ghost us after they inquire with us. Yeah. But having design decks will help your sales in the end. Might take you a little bit longer to put together a quote, but in the end, they're gonna help you book your client faster and spend more money with you. Yeah, it's definitely increased our contract yeah. totals because we include um, visuals of floral. Since we do floral, we add in floral mm -hmm. styling pieces. Um, extra backdrops that maybe they didn't think that they would want but pairs well with what their overall concept of the design is um, yeah I've definitely seen an increase in upsell as well yeah and definitely uh, what is the word I'm looking for 
I've seen an increase of clients like coming back and then requesting, hey, can you do a rendering like you did last time so I can pitch it? Um, I've had corporate clients do that a ton of times. So. so now that we talked about why we do this and what can result from doing it with your sales and your clients, let's talk about how we do this, the tangible things that we do, the programs that we use, how we get our images to look a certain way. Um, we've used a whole a few different areas to do this. We currently are doing this in Google Slides because we have a Google Drive. We use a lot of Google um, resources, and so we found it really easy to do through Google Slides, but other places you can do them are Adobe. There's plenty of programs that can do that, and Canva are some areas that we've done before. Yeah, I'm going to touch on the Adobe part because there's a few different ways that you can do this. Um, typically, when I approach a design, my typical start starting point is going to Google Slides and creating the design deck so that it's all cohesive. We have a template that we've made that we build out each slide. We make it look like it's not Google Slides so that it feels more professional. Yeah, a lot of people are like, where do you do this? It looks so professional. We're like, Slides. 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 <laughs> yeah, don't send your client, I mean, you can if you want to, but don't send your client the link to the slideshow. Like, download it as yeah. a PDF and it'll make you feel like way more professional. Okay. Um, but so we'll start there. But let's say you want to build out a deck that is to scale um, and shows off your inventory, and maybe you would even want to get really fancy and you want to move the layers so that it actually, like, the rugs look like they are flat. On Google Slides, depending on how your rugs are shot, um, you're going to see the top of it. So, like in this picture, for instance, um, you're just seeing like a flat 2D picture. Um, on Adobe softwares, you can actually make that to look like it is just straight on the floor. So it'd be like the visual element. And I've gotten really handy for you guys and created an actual video of how I create renderings and we're going to link that in the show notes so you can go to our YouTube and watch that. Um, but the programs that you use to create that in Adobe would either be Illustrator, you can do to scale on Illustrator or Photoshop. Um, it's going to take, it's definitely the more advanced option. Um, I mean the most advanced is doing CAD and um, really getting into um, the specifics of doing a 3D layout to where, you know, you can add people walking in and um, there are mm -hmm. there are design firms that do that and they're amazing and someday I will learn how to do it and maybe I'll teach you if I can. But for now, um, you can watch that YouTube video on how I think I specifically used Adobe products to do that. Um, on Canva and on um, Adobe, no, sorry. On yeah, on Canva and Google Slides, you are it's, it's really going to be a copy and paste situation for your pictures of just positioning them um, and just putting them onto a rendering. So it's going to be a little bit less, it's not going to be to scale. Um, it's more of just going to be a visual representation. It's not going to be like this sofa is going to be six feet apart from this couch, you know, or this other couch, or um, the chairs might be a little bit bigger on the visual because, you know, they're a little bit closer to the edge of the um, canvas. And so just, I would make sure you clarify that with your clients if they start to ask you if you are using slides or if you're using um, pages or Canva or whatever, and they're like, oh, is this the scale? You want to clarify it's not. Um, because you never want somebody to look at that and be like, hold you accountable right. for Those chairs are a lot bigger in person than they were yeah. on the slide. Yeah, but what's cool for um, clients who, specifically for set designs, if I'm working for a set design client, there is a lot of specifications on making sure that you're building out the set to be accurate, and especially if you're working with panel seating, you want to make sure that the sofas are going to fit in the panel and the people are going to fit in the panel, and so I'll often refer to um, Adobe to get those scaled out correctly. Yeah, depending on your client and the needs of your client, you might use different softwares to achieve that look. Um, so like Haley said, we have a client that has very specific decisions, or they are maybe they do this type of work versus someone who doesn't do this type of work. You're going to want to see different types of visuals, and so that's why it's important to know the different types of programs you can use depending on your client. So you don't always have to say you're always going to do Google Slides, you're always going to do Canva. You can have all three and have three different options for the three different types of clients that might need them. Yeah. 
And I mean, I've been doing this for about four or five years now. Um, so I've had a lot of experience playing and learning. And so it's definitely a learning curve for sure. If you're using one of the topper softwares as in Adobe or CAD or whatever, uh, but just give yourself time to practice. I would practice on, um, during the pandemic, I really wanted to get really good at visualizing staging. And so I would pull imagery of like homes and I would just stage homes with furniture in Photoshop because I had extra time. I had her stage yeah. my home that I purchased. I was like, hey, these are the sofas and chairs and rugs that I want. Can you make it look it? Can yeah. you make it look yeah. like it? No, I would do it in Adobe oh, so that I could get really good at Illustrator. And we're looking at buying a house right now, and so I'm scaling everything mm -hmm. out based on the specs for houses to see if our furniture will fit. Mm -hmm. And so it's very practical for your life if yeah. you start utilizing these tools. But yeah, help me decide if I wanted a certain chair or not. Yeah. I was like, well, that's not going to fit. Now I have to find something else. Yeah, exactly. So I would give yourself room for grace of like learning how to do these things. It's, it's taken time and refinement. And you'll probably look at your first rendering uh, like months from down the road and be like, wow, that was terrible. It gets uh, better it as you It gets practice. better as you practice for sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think what's crucial in creating these renderings is having the right photos, mm -hmm. um, having the right um format of photos and so one thing that we really focus on is making sure all of our inventory has been cut and by what I mean by cut is it has no background so it's a transparent background um, so all you see is the photo of the actual piece there's nothing behind it and that helps when you're creating these renderings not to have just like white random boxes around pictures and then it's just like white box, next inventory item, white box, you know, that's kind of confusing. Um, and so cutting those out takes some time. Um, I think when I first started working here, that was one of the projects that I had and it would take me, I mean, it took me a while to get all of those done, but now we have almost all of our inventory cut and if we get a new piece, we cut it or if we're doing floral and we have something specific, mm -hmm. we'll cut it out. Um, and there is a way to do that on Photoshop which will be linked in the show notes of how to do that. Um, there's a way to do it on Canva, which if you pay for the pro subscription on Canva, it'll do it for you and it's very easy. You literally just import the image and you select erase background and it's mm -hmm. for you. So that's a time saver for sure. And then I know you yes. have found another one. If you don't pay for Canva, removebackground.com, we will link it is a great tool because all you have to do is just drag and drop and then press download and it's done easy easy so yeah it's free so mm -hmm. love it. free so that's one way that you can do that um, and you want to make sure that you download those as png files because that will allow you to have transparent backgrounds and you want them to be transparent um, you can then import them into if you use google products you can put them into google albums that you can just link to your google slides so you can copy and paste and add them into your rendering um, or you can download them onto your desktop if you're using Adobe and just drag and drop. Uh, but that's really how you build your library of imagery. And if, let's say, you're pitching a new piece, you just quickly will cut it out um, and add it to your, your rendering. Yeah, that's where we use the free background drop um, website or Canva is if we have something specific, like maybe it's a specific flower or if it's a specific um, design that we're doing for a flower, there's often times that we are adding um, floral to backdrops that we have or to coffee tables that we have with an arrangement or something like that. And so we'll use those programs to cut that out because on Photoshop, it might take a lot longer to cut out the flower it design does. Um, does. compared to Canva or ribbonbackground.com. So um, definitely different reasons to use different areas, but it is really important. Um, and if you have a computer that works, sometimes you can just hit print, um, but sometimes you have to take a screenshot and print it. Um, so just figure out what works for you, what works for your team and your programs and your existing softwares that you have right now. If you don't have a Google subscription, maybe you use Outlook or you use something else. There's no reason for you to go in and do everything on Google and Google Photos and all that if you already have it stored with Dropbox and with another email software and so that might be a good reason to use Canva. So figure out what works for you and your team before you 
just dive right into all the things that we're talking about. Yeah. What else would you guys say to wrap up this episode are some good tips and tricks that you guys use in your backgrounds and your design decks? I would say having a, I mean, we've talked about having a library for all of your products, but I found it very helpful to specifically when I'm doing design decks um, and adding inspiration imagery, adding, um, getting me started on doing the renderings is having a really great Pinterest album and library where I can just pull from our brand's aesthetic and our floral aesthetic, or it, it gives me a lot of different ideas that I can just pull from pretty quickly instead of like racking my brain and going on Google and searching or going through, say, I mean, you can save these on Instagram too if you use Instagram, but I found it so much easier for me at least to go on Pinterest, to, to go to, if I'm trying to think of a floral concept, for instance, I'll go to our floral design board and I'll just go, it's, it's um, organized by season. So dependent on the season of the event, I'll go and I'll look and see like, oh yes, we've pinned this design and it's really cool. We've been saving it for, you know, the right client and this is the right client. So then I'll add that and then that gets me started mm -hmm. um, and it gets me rolling for sure. If you are trying to add like a specific color story to your design deck um, and you want them to have like look like paint or to look like the little daub well, you know when, when you drop it in um, a really cool thing that you can do is you can go to google and you can just in the image section you can search like either pantone or benjamin moore and kind of type in like let's say you want terracotta or red or um, coral or whatever you can type that in and then you can scroll through and you can see all the different options and you can copy and paste that and add it to your design deck to give it a little bit more design element um, for me, I would say we touched on the project details. I like to list out everything the client had said that they were wanting just so I can like reel it back in because I can tend to go overboard with design decks. <laughs> so I, and we had mentioned like this is showing that you're showing your client that you, they can trust you mm -hmm. to implement their design. So listing out everything that they have mentioned pulling from their inspiration decks and then re remembering to like include that into the deck. Um, so that's really helped yeah. me. And then really up the clients. Yeah. Trust me. That's good. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely building trust sticks in yeah. for sure. Well, it's reiterating, reiterating what they said to you. Mm -hmm. And so you're making sure the communication between you and your client are syncing up and you're not hearing something different than what they said. Um, and then on the event day, you guys are all on the same page, which is great. Um, Kaylee mentioned this a little bit earlier, but sometimes you have a client that has an existing design deck. It's really important to, when you're also pitching a design deck, to include some of their photos. Because then, again, it's going back to the communication, what they shared with you, you're accepting and you're hearing and you're seeing exactly what they're doing. And then you're finding images that we like or that you like um, and supporting that saying, hey, you pitched this ceremony arch, you pitched this uh, centerpiece or whatever it is, here's your image, but here's also a couple others that I think would really relate to that as well. And so that's yeah, really they're, important. They're coming to you as a professional. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little bit different if it is a professional coming to you as a professional. Um, so if it is actually a designer or it is a wedding planner, you want to be careful with that because you don't want to overstep and you mm -hmm. don't want to ruin a relationship. But if it is a bride or um, a, like a couple or, um, you know, like the mom mm -hmm. or anything, or even if it's just a corporate planner who doesn't specialize in design, you specialize in the logistics, that's when you can bring those things in and you can kind of, as the mm -hmm. professional, as the designer, you can bring them in and um, you can add those additional images. But you just want to be careful um, to just make sure you're not overstepping. And mm -hmm. I found that it's really easy to do that by kind of just pulsing in the initial conversation of kind of like, what is their pulse for design? What is their pulse for, are they coming to us for design or are they coming to us just for rentals? And if they're coming for us just for rentals, they are set on their design. Then I'll just add supplementary renderings to help mm -hmm. them visualize our pieces and kind of go from there. Right. Yeah, because a lot of people who do design work for a living in the events industry or not, they already have done all the hard work that you are about to try to do as well. 
and they already know what they want, and they probably aren't going to change their mind because they've already decided what looks good and what doesn't. And perhaps they have some pieces with you and some pieces with another rental company and some pieces with another rental company, and they've married that all together, so they just want to quote from you. And they want to maybe see if you have one specific lounge, they want to see it all together, and that's where a rendering would help, but you don't need to double do the work that they've already yeah. done with a new design deck. And that brings up a good point too. So for instance, we don't send renderings and design decks for every single quote. There are some quotes where it just doesn't make sense. You know, like somebody is renting a table and chairs. Like, okay, it's pretty self-explanatory that they know what to do with a table and chairs. Um, and specifically when, you know, they're coming to us and they're like, I have all my designs picked out. I just need some pillows. I just need, you know, a kickstand. I, I need a kickstand. <laughs> I need easel. a shelf. I need an easel. Or even if it's, you know, a collection of things, but they don't all pair together, it's not necessarily worth your time or worth their time to send them a full deck and a full rendering. Now, we have committed to every lounge that we send out to a client comes with a rendering because one, not only does it help our clients to get see but it really helps our team set up on site how we want those to be set up. Um, if we have a client, like our really big corporate clients who come to us and they're like, hey, we have this event coming up. Um, we, we think we want this, but we're not really sure. Could you give us some suggestions? That's when Kathleen and I go full out on conceptualizing, on spending. I mean, we spend a lot of time on those decks because it always turns into more revenue for our business and more upsell opportunities. So even if a client comes to us and says, hey, I know we want to lounge, um, but we're doing this whole big event, that's when I'll go in and think like, okay, based off of what they're saying in their, their project details, they're probably going to need a photo booth. They're probably going to need like a VIP section for their executives or they're going to need a panel. I'm going to go ahead and do the work and pitch them all of these ideas because until they see on paper like the options, they don't know what they want. Right. They're like, oh, that's a really great idea. We should do that panel. Or exactly. We should do that instead of the chairs that the hotel provides. Yes. Yeah, so I would look at your business model. I would look at your rentals and see what makes sense for you and how you will pitch different things to your clients. But for example, for us, we do rentals and we do floral. So a lot of times people come to us first for rentals because that's what we've been doing the longest and they're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And I will include rentals and floral into the design deck and concepts so that I can say, hey, I, I don't know if you know this, but we do this and this is what we can do for you. Unless they already have a florist that's already picked out, don't overstep that. Yes. But if they don't have that, and that's typically one of our questions to them, and it probably is to you as well, what other vendors do you have? What venue are you getting at? You're having your event at? Do you have a planner? Do you have, you know, you, there's some questions that you ask. And so if you also have another service, whether it's floral, whether it's signage, whether it's anything else, you do want to ask those questions because you also don't want to overstep that as well. Or waste your own time if they already have a florist. There's no point to pitch flowers. Yeah. It also can be helpful, too, um, if you want to go the extra step, even if they have a florist mm -hmm. already, um, to ask them, hey, like, or pull from their Pinterest board flowers that they like mm -hmm. and just dropping it into a lounge right. like on the coffee table because then it helps them be like, oh, right. This all makes sense right. now, and it upsells your pieces for yeah. pulling in those flower elements, even if you're not doing the flowers. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using, like, Canva background remover or the one that you suggested, it's it takes two seconds, and then you right. can just drop it in, and it's that one extra step of what's this one extra thing that we can do to this rendering that makes it feel complete? Because if you're looking at a rendering that is just a sofa and two chairs and a coffee table, and a white backdrop, that's really boring. It does get it boring. It is yeah. really boring. And so even if they haven't said that they want rugs or they want pillows or they want styling pieces, we'll include it in there and send it to them so that they get the overall feel of like, oh, wow, that's what a rug does to a lounge. That's what styling pieces do to a lounge. That's what floral does in a lounge. And even if they come back and say, hey, we don't need the rug, we don't need the styling pieces. What we'll typically do is we'll include the original rendering for them in their design deck, but then send a follow-up rendering that is just the blank canvas. So they do know on site, hey, I did sign 
this. Like, right. this is what right. I'm getting. But this is what it could have yeah, been. Yeah, well, this is your inspiration. This is what you purchased. Yes, this is your actual. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And think about your venue, too. You might go to a venue. There's a couple of venues locally here that have a whole bunch of plants that are at their venues that their clients can use. And so even though you might not be pitching plants, use the background cutters and put a plant in your lounge area to see what it looks like. And then you might add a little note, plant not included, but it does come with your venue. And so we would suggest maybe pull that in. And that, again, builds trust because yep. it's showing your expertise. So if you've been to that venue, you know what the venue offers, and you're being smart about yeah. how you're conceptualizing the design. Right. And it's being helpful for your client. If they may not know. Oh, I didn't know I could use the plants yeah. there. You might want to double-check policies on right. and if right. they can still use them. If you haven't been to that venue in a while, just don't want to promise the client right. something that right. maybe is not true. Right. But, yes, yeah, those are all really helpful things. Yes, yeah, exactly. Well, we have talked all about all of the design decks and renderings and why it's super important. Um, the few things just to wrap up, it's important to have design decks because it's one going to help your overhead. It's going to help you upsell your client. It's also going to help you trust, uh, build that trust with your client and cross that imaginary bridge of trust and getting them to book with you. And then third, it's going to help you book that client a lot faster because you've already earned that trust with them. So it's really important to start doing these. You might not do them for everyone, but it's important to at least start practicing um, in the world of design and social media and all the things that are going on in the world. These are just going to help and give your client a better idea. Um, otherwise, they're going to go to Pinterest. They're going to go to all these other places. And it's not going to be the exact same thing. So help support those other inspiration areas that your client already has. All right. Well, it's been so good talking about all this with you. We are excited to see you next week on the podcast yet again. Have a great day, guys. Bye.